Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the fall star party at, from here at the Bell Museum. Um, we're going to let a few more people come in. We'll get, get started in about a minute. You all are hopefully in the right spot. We're gonna be talking about what's up in our nighttime sky. Um, and it's actually a really nice clear night out. So I'm glad that we're, we got some, um, some good, good luck here with the clouds. We weren't quite sure based on the clouds we had last night. Um, so as we keep going, I take a look at your screen. Again, I'm letting a few people come, a uh, few more people join us. Uh, but we'll be using the Q&A box tonight. So if you have questions, please use the Q&A box. Uh, but as we get rolling, uh, I want to introduce myself. My name is Sarah. I am the Planetarium Programs Coordinator here at the Bell Museum, and I love telescopes. And I'm so happy that we are able to kick off our observing season tonight. Um, and I'm glad you chose to join us. Now, uh, as a museum, we here aim to advance our collective understanding of both the earth and the sky. And I'd like to acknowledge that the Bell Museum sits on traditional treaty land of the Dakota people. I'd also like to acknowledge the Ojibwe people, traditional keepers of the lands just to our north. Dakota and Ojibwe knowledge systems are crucial ways of knowing this place called Minnesota. And we here at the Bell honor that knowledge, the values embedded in it, and the people who keep it. Uh, like I said, questions are our favorite part of the night. Uh, do please use that Q&A box in Zoom to send in your questions and comments throughout the evening. Um, our team here is behind the scenes monitoring and answering the questions that come in, and we'll get to as many live as we can, but we will also use that Q&A box for ones that come in faster than we can answer them live. So I hope you have things you're wondering about because we can't wait to hear about them. Uh, this event is live captioned. So if you find those captions not useful or distracting, you can hide them by clicking on the live CC button on your screen. Um, I did introduce myself. Again, I am Sarah. Uh, up on our roof deck with our cameras or telescopes tonight, uh, we have two more staff members. And when they're ready, I will let them introduce themselves. They might be uh, doing some last little tweaks to make sure we have some good views to share with you. But I'm gonna go ahead and uh, let's take a look at what's in, yes, what's sir? up. Go for it, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so I will, I'll take a second here. We're, we're just, uh, we're finding uh, M15 for folks. Um, but hi everyone, I'm Thaddeus. Uh, I work in the planetarium at the Bell Museum. Camera's focusing me. Um, we just got a hello, by the way, from Spokane, Washington. So hi from, hi to folks in Washington. Uh, I guess you're escaping the rain by watching this. I assume Washington is pretty rainy. Um, we also have Megan over here. Hello. <laughs> Um, Megan is one of our students, uh, aerospace engineering here at the U. Uh, so if you've got questions about rockets, uh, ask them and we'll try to get Megan to answer them. Uh, and Megan's also controlling one of our cameras, uh, looking again, uh, we're trying to get M15 in view, uh, which is a beautiful globular cluster. And I think we'll have it for you shortly. All right, but that's it. Um, and then if the, one of our telescopes that we are looking at, kind of hard to see, but, uh, well, it's kind of that faint thing there is its hand controller. It was a much better view earlier on, let me put it that way. All right, back, sorry, sorry, back to you. Yeah, well, thank you for introducing yourselves. And yes, Megan is one of our uh, very experienced staff here at the Bell Museum. We're so happy to have, have her with us tonight. And so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen because we need to know what we're looking at before we can go outside or we have, we're gonna orient ourselves before we go outside and know how to find things. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with our star map here. Um, our star maps can be downloaded on our websites if you uh, don't quite make it into the museum to pick up your hard copy. But here is our star map, and this will be, this will be good for this month and next month. And so kind of early September, this is going to depict the sky around 9 p.m. Kind of by the start of October, this will be out at 8 p.m. So as the sun sets earlier eve each evening, um, our view of the sky changes slightly as well. And that's why by the end of October, this is the sky as we see it at 7 p.m. So star maps do have specific dates and times that they are useful for. Um, but how do we read a star map? So here we have our map um, and you might notice that it's a circle. 
Um, and that's because the outer edge of our map here is our horizon. And so if you were to stand in one spot and then look all the way around you, you would trace out a horizon with your eyes. So things that are appearing towards the outer edge of our maps, our map here, these are gonna be things closer to the horizon. Then that means the opposite is true about the center of our map. Things closer to the center of the map are gonna be straight overhead and we call that the zenith. And so this can kind of help us gauge what we're looking at and where we should be looking at in the sky, either really high up or maybe closer to the tree line if you have trees near you. You might notice that a cut, cutting across here, the middle of our star map is this kind of gray coloration area. And that is our Milky Way galaxy. So we're coming off, off of summer. The first day of fall is actually next week. Uh, but during the summer months, Earth is actually pointed towards the center of our galaxy so we can see it. Um, and that's why we have such a wide band kind of down by the Southwest here of our map. Now, in order to see your Milky Way galaxy out at night, you do need a very dark, spot away from any city lights. So it might not be something you can see uh, on a regular basis, but if you do get a chance to drive out away from the cities, take a look for the Milky Way that stretches straight through the middle of our sky um, the next month or two. Um, and you might notice here we have our directions. And if you notice, north and south seem to be appropriately placed. North is on the top of our screen and south is the bottom. But you might look that east and west are a little odd they almost seem to be backwards. And that's because star maps are not meant to be read face down when your eyes are facing the ground. So stars are above us. So if you were to print this out or have a hard copy, what you do is you'd find which direction you're facing. And so um, if I'm facing south, I'd ho hold the south part of the map towards my torso, and then I actually lift the map up over my head. And that would make east and west then uh, appropriately, align appropriately aligned to the sky. So that's why they look a little bit backwards here on our map as we're looking at it. But that's because maps are used, are supposed to be used while looking overhead. Now there are a lot of cool things out in the sky tonight. We're not gonna get to everything that's on this map here, but there are several highlights that we do wanna get to. Um, first, you might notice our Jupiter and Saturn down kind of our south, southeast. And so these down here in the kind of bottom left side of our screen, those are gonna be some of the brightest things you see out in the sky tonight. And great thing tonight, exactly, is they're right above the moon. So it's gonna make it a little bit easier to find, but they're not gonna appear as bright because the moon is gonna be way brighter than these two planets. So uh, those are on our, our list of things to see tonight with our telescopes, uh, but we'll be looking down there kind of in the south, southeast. Now, another really cool thing that's happening in about 10 minutes, I don't want us to miss it is if any of you watch the Inspiration4 launch just uh, on Wednesday evening, uh, this is the first all civilian crew to launch into space. And so they launched on Wednesday very successfully. They are orbiting um, Earth for three days and then they will come back down. And what's great about this is that uh, while we won't be able to catch it in our telescope tonight because it's gonna be flying a little bit too fast overhead, if you were to go out outside in about 10 minutes or so, um, you could see it flying overhead from kind of the southwest skies up through the east northeast side, so straight across um, our map from one side to the other side for about um, from about 843 to about 852. So it's going to be flying fast, but it's going to be a nice smooth arc overhead. So we can actually wave to these four civilians, the very first ones um, that are not uh, professional astronauts to go flying in space. And so it was really exciting to see these four launch just this past week. So Tad, um, are you ready for us to see our first uh, telescope object tonight? Well, as Tad is getting those scopes up for us, uh, we will definitely be taking a look at the moon. The moon is actually one of the things that I think a lot of people forget about because it's up quite frequently. But this time of month when we're right around the first quarter moon is actually, I think, one of the best times to look at the moon. We get some gorgeous detail on it. We see craters, we see the shadows, and it's not too bright like the full moon, um, but it's not too small and slivery like, um, like the crescent moon. Hey, Sarah. Yes. Uh, sorry, we're just moving things around there. Um, I wondered if this is a little blurry. Um, I'm the focus, I messed up the focus a little bit, but uh, this is not the moon for those wondering. 
Uh, this is Jupiter. Uh, I wanted to get a view of Jupiter though here early on uh, because it's wrapped because it's going to disappear in a, pretty soon. Um, I wanted to point out one uh, thing we we're seeing early on, which is right uh, here on your screen, that little black spot, if you're seeing it with this very quickly wavering Jupiter here, um, that is a transit uh, in Jupiter's atmosphere. So that is an eclipse, essentially, on the atmosphere of Jupiter. Um, if you were there floating in the cloud tops, you would see the sun uh, eclipsing, uh, being eclipsed by the moon Callisto. Um, from what we can tell, it's probably Callisto at least. And Callisto, we can see as, uh, if we brighten the exposure up a bit, uh, as this, uh, as this brighter spot over here on what I'm seeing is my my right to the to the side of Jupiter. Okay. Um, yeah, our, our, our the transits here uh, do last for several hours. We we were seeing it almost face on just about 30 minutes ago, um, but we're reaching the end of it. So I want to make sure that was visible uh, for our our viewers here. We also have it's getting it's much harder to see, but from what we could tell, we were also seeing sort of right on the side of Jupiter now. Um, but when we were looking at it uh, over in this side was the great red spot. Um, so that was just visible earlier on. Uh, Jupiter spins very quickly though, about nine, nine and a half hours. Uh, so unfortunately the, the great red spot, we had it, but then, well, Jupiter kept moving. So what can you do? Yeah, so no, it's a great view here because you you actually have one of our colored cameras up through the telescope. So we can see not only that shadow of the moon Callisto, uh, but we are starting to see those striped bands across uh, the top atmospheres, atmosphere of Jupiter as well. And that's one of the great things that well, you can see pictures of Jupiter taken by high, you know, super high professional telescopes. Um, but when you look at it through just a backyard telescope, very similar to what we have upstairs on our roof deck, it is just so stunning. It's not going to be the Hubble Space Telescope pictures, but the fact that you get to see it with your own eyes and here looking at it live from our roof deck, you do see plenty of detail here. Um, and so it's actually one of my favorite things to look at. And it's great for us because Jupiter is going to be out in our sky through the end of this calendar year. So if you, uh, if you go outside and look at it tonight, it'll be nice and high in the sky all evening. Um, but you have plenty of time in the next few months to, to keep admiring it and see as it tracks across the sky. And like Tad said, uh, it rotates very quickly. So you might catch red the great red spots sometimes. Now, as we're looking at this, I do want to remind people, if you have questions about what we're seeing or about what we're doing or things you want us to talk about, please use a Q&A box. We want to know what you guys are thinking about. Well, I'll um, give a shout out. We have someone from Austin, Austin, Texas. Um, I was down in, I wasn't quite in Austin. I was down in the Dallas-Fort Worth area just a little while ago. Um, I don't know what the weather's been like down in Austin, though. I hope, I hope it's ever down there. I hope you're staying safe. Yes. Extreme weather is hitting us right now all across the country. Um, a, did, a question did come in, Tad, asking us to tell us about the telescope that, you, that we're looking at through right now. But, um, hey, uh, yeah, let me, uh, let me see if we can get, Megan, do you mind, maybe we can move the camera there. I'm gonna try to change my, I'm sure you're getting right on you. And it's saying that what the weather is sunny and nice in Austin right now. So I'm glad to hear that. Um, as um, Tad is- So Megan is uh, hopefully gonna be moving our camera just a little bit here, one of our cameras, um, to get a slightly better view of it. Um, we are using a, uh, over here, if that view is any better, maybe I'll stop my share right here as well. Um, this particular telescope, oh, perfect, thank you, Megan. Uh, this is a Celestron nine and a quarter inch uh, Schmidt Cassegrain. So it's uh, essentially it's a combination of a refractor and a reflector telescope. Uh, it's on a Celestron, uh, their CGX mount. Um, I think that's the late, the model we've got. Um, and uh, we have a ZWO uh, 183mm micro uh, monocolor on the back of this telescope. Um, we'll be showing some images of that uh, as soon as we can here. Uh, the view of Jupiter we had, though, if, Megan, if you don't mind swinging the camera around, uh, is coming from. Ooh, oh, sorry. That's okay. Um, is coming from this telescope over here. This is a stellar view, uh, 130 millimeters, about four inch uh, refractor. It's an absolutely stunning telescope. It was actually a donation to the Bell Museum. Uh, huge thank you to the to the folks who donated that to us. Um, this is on another Celestron telescope mount, though. 
Uh, I'm a big fan of Celestron's work. Um, and on the back of this one, we actually just, it's a Canon T6. Um, so this is a, the camera on it uh, is a off the shelf camera. Um, nothing special about it. And it's just connected to my laptop here. Uh, and then finally, we'll get to a view of the moon, which is coming from this little telescope over here. My absolute favorite telescope. So 102 millimeter AstroTech, a nice grab and go refractor. And it's got a small, uh, another ZWO small camera on it, a 80, I forget the sense, I forget the exact model, a smaller camera on that one. Uh, but that one's looking at the moon. In that view, we can see the bright moon as the telescope's pointing out. And that if you notice uh, just up to the left of the bright moon, that little speck, that is Jupiter. So just your webcam is actually picking up Jupiter in our night sky tonight. So that's how easy it will be to find if you do step outside and take a look yourselves. And um, a little off, but uh, we've got the moon here as well. And we'll adjust the view here, sir, for, if you don't mind talking about the moon for a minute, or, or we can go to something else. Absolutely, too. we can talk about the moon. Um, I do want to say that the, the Inspiration4 crew is flying overhead right now. Um, again, we're not going to be able to catch it with our telescopes. It's going to fly a little bit too quickly for us to track it, find it, and track it. Um, but just know that we have those four civilians who are flying above us right now, um, having an experience of a lifetime up there. Um, but before I move too far along uh, of those telescopes uh, that Tad described to us, one of them is actually using mirrors. since so that was the Celestron 9 and a uh, quarter inch. So we measure telescopes by the diameter of the telescope. That tells us how big the, the mirror or the lens is. And so that one is a, a reflecting telescope um, because it uses mirrors. The other ones that he was telling you, telling us about um, are smaller in diameter, but they're a different design of telescopes. Those use lenses instead of mirrors. So we use both styles, reflectors and refractors um, to bring images to you guys. And hopefully um, in the next few months, we'll be able to invite you back to the museum and you can look through them yourselves. Um, but here we have the moon on one of those ref uh, refractors, one of those smaller diameter scopes. But this is one of the things that I love about the moon is that I, I do think it gets taken for granted, but you can see so much detail and you can see those dark maria. So those, those areas where we thought were big, huge oceans of water way back before we sent humans to the moon. And we found out they're not oceans of water, but they are actually uh, essentially dried up lava oceans for when the moon was still very molten. And we get some of those uh, great craters. And if you look down kind of in the image here that Tad is sharing with us from the roof deck, Kind of in the lower right, just barely off to this, uh, the center part, we see a, a, a very beautiful crater. But then coming out of that crater are these um, ejecta, if you will. So when, when something hit the moon, when this very large uh, piece of rock from space hit the moon to create this crater, it sent a bunch of stuff up in, um, up off the ground of the moon, and that eventually fell down and it created these great rays kind of coming out of it. So you can really start to see some of these rays when the moon isn't full, when you get some of that shadow here, because we can see that it's not, it's past the first quarter, but not quite to the full moon. And so we can still appreciate a lot of that data or the, um, the shadows and the contrast there. Um, and Great question that came in is what phase of the moon are we in? So we are past the first quarter, uh, but not quite full. So this here, we can see most of the moon, but as we're seeing it through Tad's screen, it's a little dark on the, the right hand side there. This is a waxing gibbous. So we're just a, a day or two off of our full moon. So it will appear to be growing in size or growing in illumination, if you will. We'll see more of the illuminated side of the moon here over the next few days. So we are in a waxing gibbous moon tonight. Okay, um, as we keep enjoying these telescope views, um, the question came in is, can we live stack it all? And we can, it depends on what we look at. So when we're looking at the moon here, the moon is bright enough, we don't have to live stack. And what that means is we take a whole bunch of pictures and stack them on, and so it enhances what our eyes can see. Now the moon is bright enough where we don't need that extra enhancement where we can just see it live through the camera like we are staring, uh, we're looking at right now. Um, it's when you get into things that are very far away, those deep space objects that live stacking really comes in, um, in handy, where we need a little bit longer exposure than our eyes can detect on their own, that we can take several images of the same thing and stack them on top to really enhance what we see. So yes, we can live stack. Uh, with the moon and Jupiter, we don't need to do that just yet because they're close enough and bright enough um, for us to see. 
Um, so for a question came in about more about telescopes, and that's a great thing is uh, for a backyard stargazer, what telescopes do we recommend? Uh, I don't have a particular one to recommend, but the things to consider are where are you going to store it and how heavy is it? Because some people think like, I'll get the really big one. But then when you're moving it around, taking it out of the closet and setting it up, the bigger it is, it does get kind of cumbersome. And so I like to choose something that's a little bit lighter, something that's easier to move and really fairly easy to set up. Because if it's too big or too hard to set up and get aligned, you're never going to use it. And then it doesn't matter what you have. So look for something that fits um, what you're willing to, to are able to store and then able to carry and set up. So I like something probably in the eight inch range, um, which is the optical tube diameter of our Celestron. But even if you get into like six or four in smaller diameters, those can be great. Just kind of take it out of wherever you store it, set it up for a little while, enjoy the views of the moon or of a planet, and then put it away when you're done with it. And you don't have to do too much fuss or muss with them. So find something that fits how you want to use it um, would be my, my recommendation. Um, but also a pair of binoculars are great. So don't discount binoculars if you already have some. Uh, you'll get a great view of the moon in it. Um, you can start to see some of uh, Jupiter and, and Saturn up there too. So if you have binoculars, they are multi-purpose tools. Okay, so we're getting some more questions coming in. I'm loving these. Um, what do we know about the bands on Jupiter? So Ted, are we able to switch back to Jupiter or are you moving on to our next object already for us? Okay, well, he's working on that. I saw another question coming in about um, the moon. Um, and the object of the rays that I was talking about that kind of comes spewing out of the moon when an asteroid or meteor hits the surface um, is that residual left photovers of the asteroid? Um, or is it parts of the moon itself? It's a combination of both because as something from space comes in and hits the moon, it's often going to kind of obliterate itself as well and crumble. And so there'll be the energy coming in of that object. And then there will be kind of like a mini, I'm going to call it an explosion as things get kicked back up into, um, into kind of low moon orbit, if you will. Kind of like if you were to drop a rock or a beach ball in some sand, some sand will get kicked up and then fall right back down. Okay, and so we can see those ejector rays again here. If we take, kind of take a look at um, the kind of center bottom right corner of the moon here. We see these lines kind of streaking out. You can kind of see them from some of our larger craters as well. There's one kind of on the kind of mid upper right side of the moon, kind of over in the, ooh, that was a cool thing that flew past the moon. Um, um, over kind of in the, the darker Maria as well. You can see some of the ejecta coming out. Um, and that actually helps us date how old different areas of the moon are. are. The older areas are going to have a lot of craters on them, and uh, you'll see them kind of crater stacked on top of crater. But then the newer or younger parts of the moon are not going to have as many craters. And so by studying where the craters are and kind of where the ejecta went and where it landed, we can actually start dating parts of the moon as well. Okay, yep. That's a gorgeous view. I love, I love the details there. Uh, hey, sir. So uh, we were we were looking for inspiration uh, for uh, maybe were we looking for inspiration at all or just inspiration? for? Well, we were looking for something in the sky. We don't think we saw it. Unfortunately, we did see another satellite, though, from it was going in the wrong direction. So I, hopefully it wasn't inspiration for. Um, but there were a couple other at least one other satellite we saw um, and something very bright that might have been a plane, um, but maybe something more exciting. Uh, but we're going to try to get uh, Saturn here. In fact, we should have in just a second um, our, that ZWO we were talking about. I was talking about the camera on the first telescope, that Celestron 9 and a quarter, uh, should have a view of Saturn. If you give us about 10 seconds here, we'll get that for you. Okay. And as we're looking at the moon switching over, um, one of the questions was, how old are the ejecta rays on the moon? And that really varies. So some of these more prominent craters like Tycho and Copernicus, you know, I'm not quite sure how old they date back to. Um, that's just not a number that sticks in my head. But somebody would know that because uh, we've mapped the entire moon. We've named uh, most of the craters, if not all of them. And so they're very detailed um, 
records of the moon. So I just don't remember the, the age of some of these, these ejectas and these, some of these craters. But this one kind of on the lower right, because we see that it's in the highlands, there we see um, it's more of the lighter colored rocks instead of that darker gray maria, if you will. Um, that is part of the older rock on the moon. Uh, the maria, those darker patches, uh, those are newer. There's not as many craters in them. That's when the moon was still molten and, and it kind of the molten part of the moon kind of oozed up and filled in some lower lying regions of the moon and then it hardened into the basalt flats we kind of see here. And so we do know that the lowlands or those darker marias are a lot younger rock than the highlands where you kind of see in the bottom part of the moon as we see on the screen here. Uh, so the highlands are more mountainous um, and those are kind of some of our brighter rock here on the moon. So they are going to definitely be a lot older than, um, than our maria, the, the darker rock. Um, and do we use a filter to help with light pollution? Now, we, can, we do have filters for our telescopes, but tonight we're not gonna use any of them. Uh, one of them that we might use if we wanted to would be actually a, a filter to help with the light pollution that comes off the moon itself. Because when the moon is full, the moon is actually a really big source of light pollution. And that's just natural light pollution. Um, light pollution is where you have too much light where you don't need it or don't want it. So here in the cities, we have lots of lights that turn on and they're great to keep us safe as we walk or drive on the streets. But not all the lights are done or, or installed and maybe what's the most efficient use of the lights coming out of it. Some of those lights actually shine up into the sky and block out starlight. And we don't need the light going up in the sky. So if you have a chance to put like a cap um, on a light and shine it down on the ground where we can use it, that not only uses the light more efficiently and saves us money, but it also preserves some of our dark skies by ma making sure the light's not going up. Um, so there's both natural and um, human made light pollution. They do make filters that can go um, on eyepieces or um, on one of our, our cameras uh, to kind of help cut that out but it's gonna be kind of, um, in some cases, just like putting some sunglasses on your eyes. You're gonna get some light cut out in all, um, in all wavelengths there. So we have them, uh, we're just not using them tonight. Okay, uh, looks like we're switching over soon here to see a planet because we saw uh, the moon in our sky uh, on our star map. We saw those two um, orange spots for Jupiter and Saturn. So. Jupiter is just up above the moon right now, just barely above it. And then if you were to look outside tonight, Saturn is just gonna be off to the, the west or off to your right of Jupiter and the moon. But here we have um, live shots of Saturn tonight. Um, and you can kind of see why Galileo, when he first looked at it with a telescope, he called it a planet with ears. He didn't know what these things were on sticking out either side. And actually we are getting some better resolution than Galileo probably got with his very, very early telescope um, where we can actually start to see some of that gap of between the rings and the planet itself. Now, I love all of our planets, um, but I know this one has a special place uh, in Tad's heart. Tad thinks this is the, the best planet in, of them all. Um, so this is his personal favorite. And so I'm glad we were able to see it tonight. Uh, so are there any other questions coming in um, about planets? Let's take a look. Uh, so if we get back to Jupiter, there's a few uh, questions about Jupiter coming in and some moons. Now, the moons of Jupiter are not the only ones we can see. I'm wondering if we can capture a moon of Saturn. I saw it earlier with my eye in an eyepiece. I'm not quite sure if our camera is gonna capture one of these moons on Saturn. Um, Tad, if you see it, let us know there. But it, a moon would look like just a faint little dot kind of off to the edge. And in this case, it'll be along the plane of, of the rings here. Oh, there's a few that come in. Uh, so as we overexpose Saturn or reflecting too much light coming off of Saturn, we see a few dots kind of showing up on some of the edges here. And this is because the moons are much smaller than the planet is, so they're not reflecting as much light. But we can see here, it looks like I can pick out about four different moons of Saturn. So one is kind of uh, directly above the planet rings. And we see one that's kind of just below the planet rings. And then I can see two little smudges um, just off the side of the ring cell, fairly close to the planet itself. And one of the kind of fun things about Saturn is even though it's the second largest planet, it right now does have the most known moons of any planet in our solar system. So Saturn has the most 
of these natural satellites going around it. And I believe the current count is 82 or 83. So it, it, it has surpassed the moon count of even Jupiter. Okay, and as I'm taking a look, uh, the Inspiration4 crew has fully passed us by tonight, um, but they're making another shorter pass later on in this evening from about 1026 to 1029. That's gonna be a very uh, a shorter path that's just gonna kind of go from the west sky to the west northwest. So that's gonna be just a quick flyby um, before we lose sight of that. So that's gonna be way later tonight if you wanna take a quick look for it then. Uh, but the Inspiration4 crew is flying over for another night or two. I think they're coming back down either tomorrow, Saturday, or, um, or Sunday here. So they're coming back soon. Okay, it looks like somebody stepped outside and saw it fly over from here in Lionel Lakes, Minnesota. Um, so I'm glad somebody was able to step outside and see them fly overhead. Um, and then the question was, if you do see this, this spacecraft flying overhead, is it going to be faster or slower uh, than a plane? And it's going to be pretty steady. Um, it's going to be a little bit faster because it's, it's orbiting quite quickly around the Earth. But unlike a plane that will kind of go slow, and, um, satellites will take a nice, direct, smooth pass across the sky. Um, so they'll, they'll appear to be much higher up because they are, in fact, in space, they are much higher up than our, our airplanes go. Um, but the way they fly is actually slightly different, too. And you can kind of tell us if you take a, a look for them outside, and there's plenty of satellites outside you could maybe catch accidentally even, is that they just fly over nice and smooth and a nice constant um, speed and a nice smooth arc. Um, and so they're, they're definitely, definitely fun to watch and see how many satellites can fly overhead. Uh, another one to look out for is the International Space Station. Now, I actually have personally never been outside at the right time to see that fly overhead, but I've been told and I've seen pictures that you can actually kind of tell almost like the T looking um, outline of it, if you will, or the, sh the, the um, not the shadow of it, but the, the form of it. So you can actually tell that that's more than just a point of light in our sky. If you ever get out there in time, it just right to see the International Space Station fly overhead as well. Um, okay, as we're looking at a planet here, we're, we're looking back at Saturn and we've um, kind of got it back down so we can't quite see the moon and moons anymore, but we see the planet itself. And so the question is, how do we classify a planet as a planet? Um, and that's a good question because the word planet actually comes from the Greek word for wandering star. So uh, way back, the planets in the sky, if we look out tonight, they look like bright points of light. And the ancient Greeks before the telescope was invented didn't have a closer view of them. And so they just look like really bright stars. But they notice these really bright points in the sky seem to wander around. Sometimes they're in one constellation, sometimes they're another. And they don't come back out at the same time every single year because they're moving on their own or now that we know what they're doing, they're orbiting the sun at their own rate. So way back, they got the, the nickname wandering stars, which uh, from ancient Greeks to uh, English today is um, the word planet. But wandering star is not a very scientific definition of what a planet is, because since the ancient Greeks, um, we've discovered more planets out there. We've discovered asteroids and moons and comets and a whole bunch of things, including planets outside of our solar system. So how do we keep up with what we're finding out there with a definition that helps us define what these types of objects are? And so in 2006, um, astronomers came up for the very first time, they got together and they decided to make a definition of what a planet was. And in order to be a planet now, you have to do three things. You have to one, orbit the sun, Okay. Two, you have to be big enough that you pull yourself into a sphere shape. And as we're looking here at Saturn, the planet inside those rings is a nice sphere shape. Now, no planet is perfectly spherical. Uh, the Earth and, and Saturn here are a little squashed um, based on their orbit and their rotation speed. So no planet is perfectly spherical. But we see here that Saturn is pretty much a sphere, as is the Earth. And the third and final thing you have to do to be a planet is you have to clear your orbit of similar sized debris. So pretty much you can't have any asteroids or any other space debris in your way that's roughly the same size as you. You have to clear it out. You either have to uh, kind of uh, make all that material that's in your orbit a part of you to make yourself larger, or the gravity that you have has to kick all that material out of your way. So if an object in space does those three things, 
orbits the sun is a sphere and clears its orbit of similar size debris, then it's a planet. Now, if you were born before 2006, you know Pluto and you know Pluto was a planet. But when this de scientific definition was created in 2006, it does not do that third thing. Yes, Pluto orbits the sun. Yes, it's a sphere. But no, it does not clear its orbit of similar sized debris. And that's why Pluto got moved from the planet category into the dwarf planet category. It's not a demotion. Pluto did not explode or get kicked out of the solar system. It just we now know that has, it shares similar qualities to other objects in the solar system that are not planets. Um, so that's why we moved it into the dwarf planet category or created that category for it and the other dwarf planets that are out there. Um, so we have some more, um, more people who agree with Tad and that Saturn is the best planet. Um, and a question about the rings. Are they going to disappear? Uh, we are studying the rings because we don't fully understand why some planets have rings and some don't. Now, the rings here around Saturn, um, as we're, we're studying them, do appear to be kind of raining down onto the planet. And so over the next few million years, if this continues to happen, Saturn's rings will disappear as gravity of the planet actually pulls in those individual particles um, uh, into the planet itself. So the rings that sit around Saturn might disappear one day and become much thinner. Jupiter, which we saw earlier, uh, does in fact have rings as well, but we didn't know about them until we went there with spacecraft. And that's because the rings around Jupiter are so thin and so dark, they don't reflect a lot of light. Um, so those rings could have been more abundant in the past and then have disappeared much like uh, Saturn's rings are predicted to do. Or maybe you just didn't have as many that as Saturn do um, that are not quite as bright and reflective as we see here through our telescopes tonight. Yeah. Um, why does Saturn have so many moons? Um, and do we know what causes a planet to have so many moons? Well, in the case of Jupiter and Saturn here, they are the, plant, the biggest plants in our solar system. And Jupiter is actually right on the outer edge of the asteroid belt. And so these large planets have a lot of gravity. They have a lot of mass, so they have a lot of gravity. And they can actually capture things in that go flying by. And if a rock comes or an asteroid from space comes flying by just the right angle and speed, um, it can actually get captured into the orbit around one of these gas giants, creating a new moon. Um, so we don't fully understand or know if there really is a reason that these planets have so many moons. Um, but you can think of Jupiter as being kind of the big brother of the solar system and the fact that by it capturing so many asteroids out there, there's fewer asteroids to come flying into the inner solar system where we live here on Earth. And so it's kind of could be interpreted as kind of a, a good thing that Jupiter is out there to prevent as many things from entering the inner solar system. Um, but it's all because of their gravity. That's how they're able to capture and then hold on to so many moons. Okay, so why does Saturn look like it's on its side? That's a great question here um, because you're right. Uranus is the planet that's actually on its side. So here through our camera right now, Saturn is looking like it's kind of tilted uh, north to south or from the top of our image down the bottom. And that's just because the way our camera is in our eyepiece. If we were to rotate that camera a little bit, the orientation of the image coming through to us would change. But you are correct, Saturn is um, the rings in Saturn do kind of go in that same, um, what we would traditionally call side to side uh, direction compared to the rest of the solar system and how the planets are orbiting. Uranus is the only one that's kind of turned up on its side compared to the way the planets are orbiting around the sun, absolutely. So our, our view here is partially just due to the, the way the, the camera is inside of our telescope tonight. Uh, but great observation. I'm, I'm glad you're noticing some of these details. Um, have we ever seen a moon get created from another planet? I don't know that we have because uh, some of these moons we're still discovering. We discovered about 20 moons around Saturn uh, just back in 2019. And so some of these other moons that we're discovering or they might be capturing are gonna be smaller than the big ones that we saw um, briefly around Saturn or that we know of the four Galilean moons around Jupiter. Um, so they're gonna be kind of small and it's, we might have to be, we'd have to be kind of really lucky to see them being captured and the action of them being captured. Um, but then also we'd want to monitor them as they orbit around that planet to see if they are truly captured or if they're just getting diverted um, and then still going out into space. So it, it would be more of a process than an instantaneous 
um, happening for a planet to capture a moon. Yes. Okay. Um, we have, we do have some stars out tonight, and I think Tad was going to try to to look at a few of our deep space objects that are near some of our stars. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually share with you uh, one of my favorite stars here. Um, so Tad, in a moment, I'm going to actually take over the screen from you, if that's all right. Uh, let's see here. And one of my favorite stars, and so I'm going to take over the screen. Um, is the star Alberia. So if we go back to our star map, just to kind of orient ourselves. Uh, so where we've been kind of looking down here in the southeast with Jupiter and Saturn kind of in the lower left corner of our map. But if we look kind of more towards the center of our map here, um, we see this triangle connecting three very bright stars, Deneb, Vega, and Altair. Well, Alberio is kind of right here in the middle of this triangle. This is gonna be the head of Cygnus the Swan. So we see the Swan's long neck, going through the triangle and then the wings, the swan kind of cutting across the triangle here um, in the middle of our map. Now, Alberio to our eyes, as we look outside um, straight overhead is gonna appear as a single star. Um, but if we were to look at it through a telescope, it's actually two stars. And so here is an image we were, we were able to capture um, a few nights ago. And we can see here that these two stars are actually two different colors. Now, this is one of my favorite things to look at in our summer sky here um, because you don't need any fancy camera equipment. If you just look through a telescope, um, you can see the color of these two stars coming through. The one on top of this image here is uh, more blue, which tells us it's about a lot hotter than kind of the kind of golden one here closer towards the middle of our screen, a lower part of our screen here. So these two stars, um, we call these a double star, where they're lying in the same line of sight um, from our perspective here on Earth, uh, but we don't fully uh, know yet if they are actually orbiting each other or if, they're, if there's any gravitational interaction between these two stars. Uh, the, they're about 400 and 430 light years away, um, respectively. And so they're quite far away from Earth and only about 30, um, 30 light years away from each other even. But by looking at these, you may see color, and that tells us the star's temperature. Once we know a star's temperature, we know roughly where in its lifespan it is. So stars come in all different colors because they're all different temperatures. And they're burning their fuels at different rates. So in this case, the blue star, Alberio B, is actually a lot hotter. It's going to be going through its fuel a lot faster than Alberio A here, this kind of a golden star, kind of in the lower part of our image. Now, blue stars tend to be um, in the beginning of their lifespans. Now, not all blue stars are the same age because they'll burn through their fuels at different, different rates, um, but they're gonna be towards the, the um, earlier parts of their lifespans. Kind of more of this golden color star here, like we see in the image or like our own sun. Um, these are gonna be kind of in the middle of their lifespans. They're gonna be middle-aged stars. If you go outside and see a star like Betelgeuse in the constellation of Orion um, this winter or uh, this summer, it's kind of setting, so I don't think we can see too much of it anymore. Um, Antares, which is part of the constellation of Scorpius, those two red stars are at the end of their lifespans. So they're running out of fuel, they're cooling down. And so color not only tells its temperature, but also can lead us into figuring out where in a star's lifespan it is. So we know roughly how much longer it can keep burning for or can keep producing light for. Um, so Elberia here is one of my favorite stars to look at. Um, somebody did ask about Orion in our sky. So let's go back to our star map. Now, if you take a look here, this is our star map for September, October. Um, so we're still here in late summer, early fall. Now, Orion is a favorite constellation of mine, um, but it's not gonna rise until really early in the morning or if you wanna wait for it, it's gonna be out in the winter time, kind of right after sunset. So Orion is a winter constellation. So it's not quite here on our map. It's just beyond the horizon here on the east side of our map. Uh, so we will have to wait a few more months to see Orion in our, in our winter sky after sunset, um, but it is coming. If, if it's one of your favorites, like it is one of mine. Okay. Um, a question came in about color. So we said that the blue coloration of that star Alberio um, comes from how hot it is. Because Alberio is a star, 
it is producing its own light. And so the question here about how does methane affect Neptune's color, Neptune is also blue, but because it's a planet, it is not producing its own light. And so the color of, of Neptune is different than the color of Elberio here. Um, the reason Neptune is blue is because that methane in its atmosphere is absorbing the red and the green light coming from the sun. And so we really only have the blue light left to reflect back to our eyes here on Earth. And so that's kind of like um, in art class, you have the three primary colors, red, yellow, and blue. Same thing with light, except for it's red, blue, and green. And so that's why the methane absorbs the red and green, and then Neptune is left to look blue to us here in our eyes. Um, so Tad, uh, maybe we can shoot this one back to you. Uh, there's a question coming in about how powerful does a telescope have to be to see colors around Saturn? So we were seeing some color at Saturn there when we were just at it. Um, and that's partially because we were using, I believe that was using a colored camera, wasn't it? Was that our colored camera? Or was that one of our monochrome cameras? So uh, good question. The view of Saturn we had, that was from the, uh, the monochrome, the uh, ASI 183 monochrome. Um, uh, it was very bright. So I think some of the color might, might've been seeing almost in a sense of it was yellow, but it was, it was, it was a black and white image. Um, to see color in Saturn, uh, it's like Saturn uh, is pretty easy. I mean, even through binoculars, it will appear yellowish. Um, through a four, six inch telescope, you might start to see a finer, a finer yellow color, maybe some slightly deeper yellows. Um, truth be told, it doesn't have that much color difference to look for. Uh, I think the thing I'd start to look for is actually a, a gap in the rings. Um, the, the largest gap known as the Cassini division. Uh, and that will start to be visible with a, yeah, for maybe six inch telescope. Um, I'd have to try each of those out. Um, so that would be looking at the absence of color. Uh, if you're looking at something like Jupiter, we had Jupiter up earlier um, and uh, maybe I can get an image of it from what we had before. Um, that you can start to see orangish color, kind of with binoculars up here, a little orangish. Um, and let me share just an image we took earlier. Maybe I've got a lot of windows open here. Um, there we go. Uh, this is an image we took earlier using uh, the Canon camera. Um, the orangeness of the, the zones there, excuse me, the belts, the orange belts, those come into view pretty easily. Again, though you're probably still looking at like a four or six inch telescope, uh, you'll need that slightly larger size to capture enough light. Um, but then that, um, especially on Jupiter, then the, the white uh, of the zones really stands out against the, um, the orange belts as well. And um, you can also start to see color in other other deep sky objects too, um, but you do need slightly bigger telescopes, starting at about eight inch telescope. Uh, I'm actually trying to get a view of one of those deep sky objects. Um, I'll have to dash back to the camera there to, to see if I can get in a view, um, but hopefully we'll get some color actually to show some folks as well. Okay, so as Tad is getting us ready to see some of our deeper space objects. I do wanna put some um, kind of things on your calendar to have you aware of a few upcoming highlights this, this fall. Uh, so next week is actually the first day of fall. It's a fall equinox. And so essentially what's happening here is um, in this image, we see the earth has its tilt. The, the, that black line or axis is not straight up and down in space. And so as the earth orbits around the sun throughout the year, um, sometimes, like in summertime, uh, our North Pole up here, since we live in the Northern Hemisphere, is actually tilted towards the sun. And so we experience summer. On the opposite side, we see the North Pole is tilted away from the sun. And that's when we experience winter. What's coming up next week is kind of where the sun is here, or the earth is here in this image, kind of uh, in spring or fall, where it's not tilted towards the sun, it's not tilted away from the sun, it's kind of right on the middle. So we get equal parts day and nights. That's kind of where we get equinox from. So our equal parts day and night. So we are experiencing the first day of fall next week um, as we continue through the calendar year. Um, the Orionids meteor shower is also coming up kind of mid to late October here. Now meteor showers are not just a one night event. 
So you have a few nights to go out and look for them. This is just going to be the peak of them where the potentially you could see the most meteors going across the sky. Um, and the Orions is an okay shower. Um, but what's going to kind of be a bummer this year is that it's going to happen during the full moon. And so we talked a little bit briefly about light pollution not too long ago. And the full moon is going to be so bright, it's going to wash out a lot of these meteors that are coming through. So you might not see very many of them. Um, at most, even if it was a nice dark night, you might see about 20 per hour for this shower. So it's kind of a mid-level mid shower. There's not too many of them coming through. But the moon is definitely working against us this year to see the Orionids. Um, if you are an early morning person, Mercury is going to be visible in the early morning sky by the end of October here. And so here's a shot of our sky around 645 in the morning before the sun rises. And you'll see Mercury rising above the, um, above the horizon before the sun does. And you'll have a short period of time to kept, catch a glimpse of it. Um, but you'll, you'll start to see that planet in the morning here at the end of October. And like that, um, by the very end of October, uh, you'll get a great chance to see Venus in our sky. It'll be as far away from the sun as it will appear to get. You can actually see Venus in the, the sky as the sun is setting um, tonight. We saw it earlier. And so you can see Venus uh, good, good through the rest of this month and into next month as the sun sets. Now remember to never, ever, ever look directly at the sun itself. It does have to set or be below the horizon before it'll be to like that uh, twilight look outside where Venus or Mercury will, will become visible. And they'll be some of the first things, or in the case of Mercury, uh, some of the last things you'll still see in our sky before it gets too, too dark or too bright, where we, they get mixed in the stars, in the, in the evening sky, or the sun fully rises in the daytime sky if you're looking in the morning for Mercury. So we do have our two inner planets coming up in our sky. Um, take a look for Venus. Again, you don't need a telescope to see it. It's a pretty, pretty easy to find here in our Western sky, even, even tonight and tomorrow through the end of October. Um, so there's some, some fall highlights. We'll have more for you as we keep going here tonight because there's actually a lot of cool stuff happening this fall. Um, but as we take a look back at our questions, I love that there's so many questions coming in. Um, one of them was about what keeps the rings around Saturn distinct um, instead of kind of gathering into one big ring. Uh, well, the rings themselves are made out of particles. Um, so it's not just a, it's not a solid continuous um, substance or a solid continuous um, object out there. There are like chunks that could be about the size of the end of your finger, uh, maybe up to a small um, kind of ball shape orbiting around Saturn at very fast speeds. Now, between all those rings, though, um, are moons of Saturn. So not only are moons kind of scattered out throughout, we saw a few of them out in the outer limbs, um, but there can be moons inside the rings. They kind of act as like snow plows, if you will, and it plows a clear path through the rings. And so, or it kind of herds material back into the ring structure itself. So we get these divisions, and Tad mentioned the Cassini division, which is the largest gap between the rings there. As, um, as they kind of make their own paths. And uh, it's all really just gravity, keeping these individual particles orbiting around Saturn, much like um, satellites orbit around the Earth. Um, so it's all, it all just comes down to gravity. Gravity is actually a really powerful tool out there in space. Um, so how much bigger are Saturn and Jupiter compared to Earth? They are ginormous. Um, so if I'm remembering correctly, from edge to edge uh, of Saturn's rings, from one edge of the rings to the other edge, we have about 21 Earths lined up across the ring system. Uh, I think it's about 12 to 13 planets itself could go across Jupiter, um, and then about maybe nine-ish across Saturn itself. But the rings, when we look at Saturn, um, are quite expansive there. So there's a reason why we call them gas giants. They are gigantic compared to our own planet Earth. Um, so continuing with this, the, the, the rings here, um, we have a question about uh, how are the rings of Saturn different from debris? Well, the debris in the rings, we, we did talk about how planets have to clear their orbits of similar size debris in order to be considered a planet. Um, but the similar size is the key there. Uh, this debris around Saturn is uh, 
much, much smaller than the planet itself. So if we go look at a picture that we had, we took of, of Saturn not too long ago as Ted is switching us over to our next live shot. Um, so here's a picture of Saturn. Um, and we can see that division between the planet and the ring system itself. Um, but these rings, like I said, are about the size of the end of your finger, uh, maybe up to a, a ball or a basketball size shape thing here. These are uh, much, much smaller even than our human bodies. Um, so they're not really considered debris around a planet because the, the planet is so much bigger. It doesn't, it doesn't really care that it has the ring system orbiting around it. It is in control of it. It has, it has captured it and um, its gravity is determining what those pieces are doing. So um, Saturn has cleared its orbit and has these gorgeous rings for us to look at here. Okay. Um, what is, so we were talking about the Inspiration4 mission not too long ago. Um, what is your favorite space mission and why? So this is a great question. I think we probably could each answer this in a different way. Um, I don't know if I have a favorite space mission to tell you the truth. I really love uh, just the design of the space shuttles back from the 80s and 90s. I just, I, I love the, the kind of the airplane-ish look of them. Um, but I also really like Apollo 17 uh, because that, that mission had a geologist on board. And they were going to go to this run area of the moon and um, and take some rock samples. But he said, hey, I see some what he called orange rock over just off the area outside of the area they were going to, going to go look at. But because he was a geologist, and it was it was interesting to him. He went and collected some of those samples. So I like the idea that when we send humans to places like the moon or eventually Mars, they can do more than robots can. Robots have to do what they're programmed to do and what they're coded to do. Whereas uh, there's some things that we just wouldn't know to look for if we had to program a robot to do it. But humans going on the moon like Jack Schmidt there in Apollo 17 just said, hey, there's something interesting over there scientifically and I'm gonna go take a sample of it so we can bring it back to earth and, and analyze it. So I like that, that mission or that example from that mission because it shows um, why we do want to send humans further into space. There's just some things humans can do that robots can't do. Um, and I'm really looking forward to uh, the Artemis mission coming up here. Where we're going to send the first uh, woman and the first person of color to the moon. And then hopefully by the decade of about 2030, somewhere in that decade, we're sending humans to Mars for the very first time. Um, so I really like the prospect of what's happening here and how we're um, advancing space um, and human, human space flight. Um, and then I will let Tad or Megan, as they have a chance, come in and maybe they'll have a slightly Hey, Sarah, can you stop your screen share, please? Oh, yes. Sounds like he has something cool for us. All right. Yep. We're just going to uh, take a second here. We'll jump over. Ooh. Ooh. Well, now it's off. <laughs> of course it is. All right. So <laughs> we'll try to get this back. Oh, we had a great view for y'all. Um, we got a view of a beautiful globular cluster known as M15, Messier 15. It's a, one of my favorite globular clusters, which is not saying a lot. I have a ton of favorite ones. Um, this is a globular cluster near the constellation of Pegasus. So it's actually coming right off the nose of Pegasus. If you look, I believe it's marked on the star map. I, I think I made sure to put it in there. Uh, it is a collection of about 100,000 stars, plus or minus 50. Um, and it's one of the oldest globular clusters we know of, uh, which is saying something. This is a little over 12 billion years old. That's a billion with a B. Now, this is like a lot of globular clusters. They all, these are collections of hundreds of thousands of stars. They're all incredibly old. Uh, and these are, this one here is orbiting around our Milky Way galaxy. So it's located a little over 30,000 light years away from us. Uh, and it's going around the Milky Way. And the latest research suggests that it actually used to be part of the Milky Way galaxy. So this collection of stars actually started inside the disk of the Milky Way. And then as the Milky Way probably collided with another galaxy, that collision and the merger uh, threw around, the gravitational effects threw around this cluster of stars until it ended up on this extremely uh, large orbit outside the galaxy. And uh, it's undergone, because of its age, it's undergone something called core collapse. So as all of these stars are moving around, the orbits are, are pretty randomized. Um, but eventually gravitational interactions cause these stars near the inner center, the inner few uh, tens of light years to draw inwards. Um, so we end up with this very bright center part of the cluster um, and then these wispy collections of stars in the outer edges. Um, kind of always looks to me like 
Um, we've almost got like four, in this view at least, especially it kind of looks like there's sort of an X of stars coming out from it, uh, going up from, uh, well, I can't draw on this screen here, but uh, going up from the top and right, left and, and bottom, uh, left and bottom right. Um, and there are approximately 100 or so globulars going around the Milky Way. Uh, they're very common. We've also spotted a bunch around the Andromeda galaxy as well. Um, so they're very common part of uh, star or galaxy formation. Um, and we can tell then in a sense uh, a little bit about how galaxies have changed uh, over billions of years. So we can learn a little about these mergers and, and evolution of galaxies. And oh, we've got to apologize. I'm speaking a little fast here. It's gotten a little chilly out here on our deck with the cold. So I'm speaking a little fast to stay warm, I think. Um, I'll take a chance on this, Sarah. You've been answering all these questions. So I'll, I'll take a look through these questions too to, to give, give you a break. Um, so we're asking if we live stack it. We were trying to live stack it, but our program was actually running some errors with live stacking. Um, and it was, it was causing these stars to, uh, to drift. Um, or rather, the, the image was, was drifting and it wasn't working too well. Um, and I'm trying to see what, what else have we got here. Um, there was the question about your favorite mission, if you have one. Oh, um, like space mission, it, it would have had to be, I mean, can I choose ones that have ended? Is that, I mean, I did. Anyone? Okay, excellent. Um, it's going to be Cassini, definitely. Uh, the Cassini spacecraft uh, was at Saturn, it visited, it was around Saturn for about, oh, 13 years. Um, it really, uh, really opened up Saturn to us, to what we know about it. Um, we'd only, we had seen images, great images before. Um, Pioneer Voyager had shown us a lot about it. Um, but having a dedicated mission at, at Saturn for so long, just, it was incredible. Um, so it gave us information about the rings. That was the data that helped us get an idea of the formation, uh, most likely from a large moon. Um, it revealed uh, what had been briefly glimpsed by the Voyagers, that this hexagon on the North Pole of Saturn, uh, this beautiful massive hexagonal wing, wind feature, um, which we now think is caused by two, essentially it's a, it marks out an area where the wind speed changes quite drastically. And that difference in wind speed uh, causes a, uh, what we call a standing wave um, within the atmosphere. Uh, we've been able to duplicate actually that on, in labs here on Earth. Um, so we're able to model now sort of what's happening in Saturn's, at Saturn's atmosphere here uh, on, our, on our own little blue planet. Cassini discovered dozens, I, I think we're up, I think, it, I think it's the count as dozens of moons around, around Saturn. So I believe it was mentioned earlier on, we have 82 moons around Saturn um, and a good chunk of that was data from Cassini. Uh, it also gave us good images of those moons as well. So what we see, I know we saw it earlier is tiny little specks of light Cassini showed us as incredibly intricate worlds. Um, moons like Pan and the Rings, uh, which if you look up the moon Pan, it kind of looks like a walnut. Uh, moons like Iopetus, which is this really cool, uh, this uh, dual-sided moon. One side is very bright white, and the other side of Iopetus is uh, this darkish reddish brown color, um, which most likely comes from uh, because it's tidally locked and one side gets a little bit more heat on it um, and that causes the surface to sublimate and the gases, uh, the methane to, to sort of move around in a quasi atmospheric effect, I guess I'll say. Uh, moons like Mimas, um, the, also known as the Death Star Moon, if you look up some pictures of Mimas around Saturn, uh, it's just absolutely, it's so cool. Um, if you're a Star Wars fan, I guess. For Star Trek, I don't know what there is for you. Um, I'm sure there's something around Saturn for you. Um, but yeah, I, and, and, so, and then uh, anyway, yes, Cassini is by far my favorite mission. Uh, uh, if you couldn't tell from everything I just said there. Um, it's given us some great photos. My favorite yeah. photos comes from Cassini, where I was actually looking past Saturn in the rings to find that little tiny speck up the corner that yes. is. Uh, so as you're still working through here, a question came in about what program are we using to share these telescope images? So right now, this camera, can you tell us about the program a little bit? Uh, yeah, this is, um, uh, we're using, uh, well, it's a ZWO camera and ZWO uh, also makes a program for uh, ASI. And so we're using an ASI Air Pro uh, microcomputer. It's, a, it's a, essentially a customized Raspberry Pi, actually. It's a very cool little piece of technology. Um, and then this is their app, the ASI Air app. 
um, which talks to that and allows us to do a variety of things um, when it wants to when it wants to work correctly. Um, including as people have asked about live stacking. Um, one of the great things about this is uh, it does allow you to capture an image and then it adds it on top of the other previous images um, and uh, using some internal logic and math, uh, it, it subtracts out what you don't want and adds what you do. Um, and so through live stacking, you're able to build up a, a really detailed image of whatever you're looking at. Tonight, uh, well, it, it is a piece of technology. So tonight it has decided not to work as nicely as we would like it to. Um, but yeah, it's a very nifty little uh, little piece of software and uh, and hardware to go along with it with that uh, ASI Air Pro. And then um, we're just using it on a tablet here, which is what screen you're seeing. Um, and so we're just sharing it through Zoom on the tablet screen. Yeah, yeah. So this is just, a, I think, a Samsung tablet. But yeah, just a tablet. It works on whatever different programs you got, Android or iOS or whatever, you, whatever you've got. Okay, so right now we're looking at M15 still. Tad is showing us this, this gorgeous globular cluster um, in Pegasus. Um, but I'm gonna share a few more things that are coming up this fall because I do wanna keep a few other cool things on your um, on your radars and on your calendars. And then we'll cut, cut back to whatever Tad has for us next here. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and see if I can steal a screen from you, Tad. And, um, we have another meteor shower coming up in November. So we have the Orionids in um, October. In November here, we have the Leonids coming up, which is a little bit better of a meteor shower. Um, but again, we're going to be battling the moon and the light pollution coming off the moon. So the Leonids here are going to peak around the 17th and 18th. But you can go out a few nights before, a few nights afterwards, and, and see a few cutting across the sky as well. Um, it will be the waxing gibbous moon, so not quite full. Uh, so you might not see as many as uh, you might expect to on a nice dark night with no moon out. You might see up to about 15 meteors per hour. Um, but another th cool thing that's happening uh, this November is that we have a partial lunar eclipse coming up. And so it's ever so slightly not a full lunar or total lunar eclipse. Um, and so this is kind of a, an image of a, a past lunar, a partial lunar eclipse, where most of the moon is going to kind of pass through the main part of Earth's shadow, but just a little sliver of it here on the kind of the bottom part of our image is not going to pass through the Earth's shadow. Um, so that's why it's not a total lunar eclipse, it's only a partial, because most of it here is going to go through, but not all of it is going to go through Earth's shadow. And so this will start about just after midnight on November 19th. So uh, 12 a.m. on the 19th. The maximum part of the eclipse will happen around 3 a.m. So that's when it's going to appear um, most blocked or most red, if you will. Um, and then the eclipse will be over by 6 in the morning. So in order to see this, you are going to have to be a really early morning person. Um, I am not an early morning person, so I might miss this one. Um, but it will be fun to see. Now, the reason lunar eclipses kind of have take on this reddish hint to them actually has to do with the light passing through the Earth's atmosphere. And the more pollution, whether it's natural, like a volcano just um, erupted, or man-made, uh, human-made pollution in our atmosphere, the deeper red the moon will appear during these eclipses. Uh, so we do have a cool eclipse coming up in November uh, that I want to put on your radars in case you are early morning people. Um, a few more questions came in as we're looking at a picture of the moon here is how is the moon differentiated from other debris around the earth? Again, kind of getting back to the question of what is a planet? Well, the moon is only about as big as the United States. So the moon is significantly smaller than the earth. And the earth is kind of in control of the moon, if you will. The moon is orbiting us. So we have uh, the earth's gravity ha is strong enough where it's pulling the moon and influencing how the moon is moving. So the moon is not considered debris in our orbit. We are in control of it, or the earth is in control of it. And the moon is significantly smaller than the earth. So it is not considered debris or something that's in our way of why the earth would maybe not be considered a planet. But the moon is definitely bigger than some of the uh, chunks of rock out there like asteroids or even smaller bits like meteors. Um, but the moon is a natural satellite of the earth. So it's something that formed naturally that is orbiting our planet. Uh, so that is kind of how it's differentiated uh, between other, other things in space just floating around out there. Uh, so, and it is true that the US, we did go to the moon. 
Um, if you've heard otherwise, that's just kind of a fun story. It is a false story, but we did go to the moon. Humans have landed on the moon and we are going back. And that's what the Artemis missions are gonna do for us here in the next few years. Um, and we will dive deeper into the Artemis mission here in November for our November star party. So it's coming up, It's the Artemis one is gonna launch here in the next few months. And we'll go all into that in a few months if you wanna come join us um, in November for that. Um, but there's even more fall highlights out here coming up. Uh, we've gone through September, October, and now November. Uh, December is really interesting, I think, because we're going to get one of the biggest meteor showers of the year. The Gemini's meteor shower is uh, maybe only second to the Perseids that happened back in August. Now, uh, the Geminids here, um, we're still going to be we're still going to be battling uh, the moon phase. It's going to be a waxing gibbous, so there is going to be plenty of natural light pollution out there. Um, but there could be up to 50 meteors an hour. So even with light pollution, there is still a chance that you're going to see some, um, at least some of the brighter meteors coming through in the December shower here. Uh, typically, meteor showers are best viewed after midnight. Um, but with the, the almost full moon here, it, it's really not going to affect you all that much if you want to view it before midnight or after midnight, because if the moon is up, that's going to be our biggest hindrance to seeing all the even dimmer meteors out here. But this is definitely one to check, uh, check out in the sky coming up here in a few months. Um, a really exciting thing that's happening in December, the James Webb Space Telescope is finally going to launch. It's been um, years in the making. And so it now has a set launch date here, December 18th. And so the James Webb Space Telescope is kind of the follow-up to the Hubble Space Telescope. The Hubble um, was revolutionary in how we understand the universe and what's out there and how far away things are. Uh, James Webb is even going to do more than Hubble um, once it does launch here. And that is the topic of next month's Star Party. So we're going to go full in depth into the James Webb next month um, coming up. And then kind of finishing out this calendar year um, in the fall, it will be the first day of winter on December 21st when uh, the North Pole of the Earth is tilted away from the sun there. And so those are some fall highlights to kind of pay attention to as we move through the next few months. Um, but do you have anything else to share with us, Tad? Any more cool views from the scopes up there? Yeah, actually, uh, if we'll backtrack a little bit here. Um, I believe you were talking about this earlier um, and a uh, little, little overexposed here, but uh, this is the star or the double star Albireo. So I believe, you, you talked about this earlier, correct? Is that? Yes, we, we saw a picture we took a, a few nights ago of Albireo. Yeah, um, well, I, we, I was nearby in the sky trying to get something else and this came up. Um, this is this is not quite in the fall. It is better seen in the summer, but we'll, we'll still have it for a few, well, good, almost more a month, uh, another month here. Um, but this is this beautiful uh, dual color star, um, a nice orange yellow one, uh, more like our sun, and then the big bright blue one that we see here positioned above it on the screen here. Um, but this is uh, really beautiful to look at. Um, I, I, one of my favorite sites is, I think, Sarah, as you were saying, as, as well as one of, as one of yours. Um, we also, I did get uh, some images as well. I just wanna, it, it was being kind of weird, um, but I was able to get an image of uh, another object in the sky. Let me see if I can find, uh, find the saved image here. There we go. Um, what I was sort of looking at nearby it, uh, is an object known as M57 or the Ring Nebula. Uh, someone was asking about color earlier on. What does it take to see color in, in objects? Um, and this is one I was trying. I was uh, I was happy to get. Um, this is a planetary nebula. Uh, so M57 is the uh, end of a star's life, a uh, star quite like our sun actually. And if you have a good size telescope in about eight inches or so, uh, you can start to pick out color in this particular nebula. Uh, the, the greenish blues come into view. And uh, it's out of everything in the night sky, I'd say this is probably one of the easier objects um, to start to see some color in. Um, doesn't mean you're gonna see it right off the bat. It does take definitely several minutes, um, if not upwards of tens of minutes to, to pick that out. You really have to let your eye get dark adapted. Um, and of course, it always helps to have dark skies as well. Uh, with a camera, it's a lot easier because you can set the exposure. There's about a six second exposure 
um, at uh, about 1600 ISO um, for, for your camera buffs out there. Um, and that of course makes it a lot easier to see that detail. Um, with a good enough camera, uh, you might be able to pick out near the very center of the nebula, a white dwarf, the collapsed remains of the core of this original star. Um, and that white dwarf star at the center shining outwards is uh, putting out light that uh, energizes the gas from uh, the atmosphere of the star that's puffed off into space. Um, so it, it's this combination of the white dwarf and then those outer layers as well that give us, that give planetary nebulas uh, really uh, intricate shapes. Um, and the ring nebula, we're, we're, we're essentially seeing it from an way face on. Um, this gas is being ejected out in, in towards us in space, um, which is why with that brighter outer ring where there's more material, uh, Astronomers have been able to measure the density of gas and the way it's moving, and they've been able to see that it's more elongated. In fact, it, if you could sort of look at it from 90 degrees, uh, sort of tilt at 90 degrees, it would look more like a football actually stretched out in space. Um, this is a fantastic uh, planetary nebula to start with. If you're starting out looking for, for deep sky objects, this is a great one to start with. Um, it's pretty easy to find. It's, it's right nearby the star. It's right in the constellation of Lyra. Um, so look for the star Vega on that star map um, and look in between the uh, last two stars um, at the end of the harp. Um, and right in between those two stars is, is M57. Um, it, it's very easy to find, which is one of my criteria for what makes a great deep sky object, personally speaking. Yes, I would agree. Um, and if you do have that star map that uh, you can find on our website, Ted mentioned uh, it's also called M57. It'll have a little blue dot by it or a little blue square by it. So we do help you find some of these deep space objects in our star map that is on our website. Um, Sarah, I think there's there's one question that just came in, um, or at least I'm I'm just seeing it. Uh, someone asked if they, essentially can they take pictures of planets and stars, um, and I just wanted to pop in and say yes. Um, in fact, these days, uh, you know, we're using some different equipment, um, telescopes and whatnot, but these days, uh, the latest cell phones actually take really fantastic views of the night sky. Um, so really just going outside, um, uh, whatever sort of latest models of cell phones are, um, take your pick. Uh, they often have a night mode feature um, where you can set it, where you can, where you can change the exposure length on the camera and capture that very faint light. Um, I've seen some pictures from friends who've taken um, beautiful views of, for example, the, the Big Dipper, um, which is a great thing to start with. Um, these broad, these uh, wide structures in the night sky. Um, ooh, something just flew past the moon there. Um, parts of the sky that, that are things that take up a large part of the sky, like groups of stars. Um, and then if you really get into it, yeah, getting a, a DSLR um, and starting out with nightscapes um, with, with a off the shelf ca camera like that. Um, then, and then really getting into it um, with, if you wanna get into telescopes and astrophotography with, the, with more specialized cameras. Um, it's really, the sky is the limit when it comes to what you wanna do. Um, I'd still just start with your cell phone though, go easy. Actually some of my favorite pictures that I've taken through a telescope have just been on my camera because uh, I'm not always the most patient with working with technology. And if you're if you're like that where you don't want to sit in putts and then go in and add layers and subtract a bunch of stuff, your cell phone does great jobs actually. Um, I've, I've had have had really good luck just holding my cell phone up to an eyepiece. If you have a pair of binoculars, you might want to stabilize them as you are pointing it at an object like the moon. Um, but you could take it a cell phone picture through a lens of a pair of binoculars as well. And you get some, you could get some good detail of the moon here. Um, we do have just a few minutes left here and there are several questions still remaining. So I wanna make sure we get to as many of them as we can. Um, as we're enjoying the view of the moon here tonight, uh, one of them was back to the inspiration for, um, it was very bright in the Western sky when it flew overhead uh, shortly at about 8.45 but then it became dimmer as it got to the Northeast. Well, that happens because uh, light is reflecting off of that uh, spacecraft, much like the light's reflecting off the moon. So as that spacecraft moves and orbits around the earth, it's gonna get to the point where not as much light is able to reflect uh, in our direction back to us. And that's one of the reasons why the next flyover tonight between 1026 and 1029 is so short, is because it's flying from West to West Northwest, 
so it's cutting a shorter path across our sky, but it also has to do with uh, the angle of the sunlight hitting us. As we get closer to midnight, we're not going to get that angle of light reflecting off the spacecraft back to us um, until we get back around to daytime, um, and kind of the dawn hours. And so it just has to do a little bit with geometry and how the sunlight is reflecting off that object orbiting around us. That might, it's also one of the reasons why uh, some satellites you'll see going nice and smooth across and then you don't actually see them set below the horizon. They just kind of disappear mid sky as they just got to a, a way where the light isn't reflecting in our direction anymore. Um, but uh, if you go to Heavens Above, that is a website that tracks not only the Inspiration4 uh, satellite or the spacecraft, but it also tracks the International Space Station. Uh, Spot the Station is another good website if you want to take a look and try to time it when you go outside to see those flyovers. Um, so those are two websites you can go check out uh, to see if you want to capture just the right moment and go outside and see these uh, human uh, spacecraft flying over our heads here in Minnesota, because they do take several orbits around the Earth every every few hours, about every 90 minutes they do one full orbit around the Earth. That's how fast they're, they're flying out there. Um, another kind of related spacecraft uh, question is, if a spacecraft came in or flew straight through our galaxy, what are the chances of hitting a star? Well, it turns out outer space has lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of empty space in it. And so uh, if you were to try to fly through, you would have well an advance notice to avoid any of those stars. Definitely if you, as you were flying closer into the center of our galaxy, the stars would be more densely uh, populated in there than they are out towards the edges of our galaxies. Um, but there is a lot of space in outer space. It is not like flying through the asteroid belt in um, in all those movies where spacecraft are you know moving and and having to navigate very quickly um, and meticulously to get through all the asteroids without crashing anything. That is not how space is. Space is very spread out, and there's lots and lots of room between things. Um, to give you an example, we consider an asteroid a near Earth asteroid if it's anywhere between 93 million miles from us. So. Uh, 93 million miles to be referenced, that's the distance from the Earth to the Sun. If an asteroid's anywhere in there, we call it a near-Earth asteroid, even if it's, you know, really not all that near to us by our human definitions or human standards of how far away things could be. So there's lots of space out there in outer space. Um, uh, some questions about moons of Jupiter again. I don't know if we have a chance to switch back to Jupiter um, in the last few minutes we have together. But what I can do is show you a picture that we took of Jupiter um, a few nights ago. Um, because Jup uh, Tad showed us a few images of, um, of Jupiter and uh, the, the shadow that Callisto was, was projecting on it and how the Great Red Spot was actually moving just out of view here. But if we take a look here, I'm going to steal a screen again from you, Tad. Um, if we take a look at Jupiter from Wednesday night, we see the planet here in the center of our image, and it is a little washed out. because that's really the only way you're going to start to get some of the light reflecting off the moons here uh, that we can kind of see cutting in a diagonal across our screen. And again, it's only diagonal like this because of the angle of our camera in our, our um, essentially the eyepiece uh, position in our telescopes. Um, but so on Wednesday, we saw all four of the Galilean moons here orbiting around Jupiter. Uh, so we have Callisto, Europa, Io, and Ganymede. Uh, so these are the positions of them uh, on Wednesday night. Uh, we had a brief glimpse of them early, early on tonight in our, in our live stream here, that they have shifted directions. Callisto here up top is actually what the moon that's causing that shadow on Jupiter tonight. Uh, one of the cool things about this is not only do we get the moons around Jupiter, um, but here in this image, we can kind of see these two little indents. Now, it showed up better on the, the image that Tad shared with us, the live image of the planet tonight, where it wasn't overexposed like this. Um, we could see just the, the planet then. We see these two little kind of indents on the edge, and those are actually some of those bands, those stripes across the planet here uh, with our coloration. And so uh, it looks like we can switch over back to our live view here. Yeah, sorry to sorry to grab grab that oh, away. From sorry, me. I didn't mean to do that. I meant to end mine. So oh, did you? okay. One sec. All right. Um, it's fine. Um, where were we? We were. So I got half dozen programs there. Um. And so here's some live shots uh, of. Yeah. Here's some live shots of Jupiter. Um. Uh. 
if I can get a little different view here. Um, yeah, uh, this was a this is a, this is a wider field of view here um, with uh, the four moons all visible, one down very far on the bottom there. Um, it is it is definitely overexposed here um, that you really have to do that um, to. Well, you don't have to do that, but uh, to get the moons in view, uh, it helps to really bounce the exposure up. Of course, that makes it harder to see Jupiter there. Um, and I, I'm actually going to take a quick look at what um, moons we have here. Uh, it's always kind of anyone's guess, unless you've got a nice program. Um, anyone who knows me knows I love Stellarium. And uh, it looks like that one moon down by itself on the bottom, the very bottom is Ganymede. Um, the moon, uh, and then we've got that triangle of moons up there near the top. Um, the one on the very top is Europa. And then those two that are very close together, the left and right is Io on the left and Callisto on the right. Um, so coming down again, we have uh, Europa and then Io and Callisto on the left and right and Ganymede way down there at the bottom. Um, Ganymede, the third moon out, but right now we're seeing it the furthest away from Jupiter there. Uh, and uh, I might just switch programs. This one's been this one's been giving me some trouble now, um, but I'll try to get those view of the um, of the stripes back as well. So it might just take me a few minutes. But if you wanted to maybe talk about that again briefly, yeah. Uh, so you can see just from the image uh, before two nights ago, where we had two moons on one side of Jupiter and two moons on the other side, to tonight where three of them are on one side. The moons orbit the planet very quickly. And so it's kind of fun to see and to track them. And you could actually kind of do that, uh, create your own project with it, if you will, much like uh, uh, Galileo did back in the early 1600s is take a look at them from one night to the night. And you can have a circle in the middle for Jupiter. And there's a little like little X's where you see the other moons and kind of sketch them out um, and really do track them as they orbit the planet. And one of I think my favorite th reasons to look at the Galilean moons in the evening sky is because they were some of the very first evidence that uh, scientists had to show that Earth was not the center of the solar system, because we thought way back when that if the Earth were not the center, we would lose our moon, that everything had to orbit us. Uh, but taking a look at Jupiter and seeing that it can hold on to these four very large moons, and now today we know that it has many, many more moons out there, it proved that a planet could have moons, and those moons could have absolutely nothing to do with our home planet Earth. And so I love the historical context and seeing what those early astronomers first saw with their uh, really early rudimentary telescopes and to see just how far we've come in such a short period of time in our understanding of, of our own solar system and Earth's place in it. Um, and as Tad is uh, kind of showing us, oh, there's some lovely banding here on Jupiter one last time here. Um, it's one of the great things to look at in the sky you don't need a telescope to see it. It's just one of those bright spots right above the moon tonight. Um, the moon will be a little bit further uh, towards the east or to the left of the, of the gas giant plants tomorrow. Um, but just looking at it with your eyes and seeing that bright spot in the sky or being able to see it through a pair of binoculars or a telescope like this to see some of these moons, I think are just there's, there's no replacement to just getting out there and looking with your own eyes. Um, it looks like... Um, we are almost at the end of our time tonight, but uh, we'd love to have you back here at the museum, uh, kind of talking about many different things. If you are interested in talking about black holes or planets outside of our solar system, we talked a lot about what makes a planet a planet tonight. Uh, come to one of our planetarium shows. We'd love to see you there and talk more with you. Uh, qu questions are our favorite part of our planetarium shows as well. And uh, I do want to share a few more um, uh, last things with you coming up on our calendar of events because we have some we teased them tonight with some of our fall events um but next month we have a back-to-back -back event nights thursday and friday um we can see one glass glimpse of saturn here in our on our scopes but on fr uh, thursday october 14th and friday october 15th we'll be talking all about the launch of the james webb space telescope coming up here and so I'm going to take over the screen here, Tad. So we'll take one last glimpse of Saturn as we wrap up. Um, and so uh, next month here on our virtual star parties, we'll be talking about the James Webb Space Telescope on Friday night. But the night prior on 
um, Thursday, October 14th, we'll actually be talking with a, a, an expert from NASA on this historic mission in this telescope that we're going to send into space and what it can do and how it's going to revolutionize um, starting even more so than Hubble did when it first launched back in the 90s. And last but not least, I want to thank each and every one of you for joining us tonight and sticking around with us. We saw some great objects. The, the weather cooperated beautifully with us tonight. I encourage you to go outside and look for yourselves. Uh, but star parties here and our astronomy programs at the Bell Museum are possible um, by the Ruth and John Huss and the generosity of donors like you. Uh, gifts of any size make a big impact here at the Bell Museum. So thank you all for joining us tonight. I have a wonderful weekend and I hope to see you back here next month when we talk about the James Webb Space Telescope. Bye everyone. <laughs>